All right. Uh, hey guys, uh, welcome to the session. Uh, my name is Jungi. Uh, I'm an engineering manager from Snap. Today, my team and I uh, are super excited to join the summit and talk about Airflow at Snap. So, um, if you're building a new environment or if you're like modifying or upgrading your existing environment and curious, you know, how other people are doing it and what kind of mistake and how they fix this kind of things, and we believe this is the right session. And hopefully some of the learnings and, you know, you can take away and help yourself uh, on your own journey. So, um, yeah, let's get started. So first we're going to cover some of the intro and share some numbers and what, how we have been doing Airflow so far. And then we're going to, in detail, we're going to talk about some architecture choices and some of the internal tools and the security system we build to make our uh, environment more secure. And lastly, of course, we're going to touch some migration, you know, how do we migrate our users and their DAGs from A to B. So first, what is Snap? Uh, we are the parent company of a pretty popular social app called Snapchat. Um, like, since last, from last quarter, we have about like 397 million uh, active users, like daily active users across the globe who use the app to, uh, you know, talk to their close friends and families. Um, they're using our augmented reality lenses to express themselves and also explore some of the short-term videos and uh, stories and discovery content uh, using uh, the app. So to support the business, we, we actually also have this kind of hybrid uh, in, uh, cloud environment. We deploy our services on both GCP and AWS. And because of this, primarily we, uh, we have a lot of data apps that's either managed or hosted by this platform, uh, including like Dataproc, Dataflow, uh, BigQuery, or GCS. And our Airflow deployments are on GCS, uh, together with a lot of like data applications. So it's pretty dominant in the company where it powers almost most of the, you know, like the major business areas, including like ETL, reporting analytics, uh, some of the ML workflows, and also um, different kind of business or products backend data movement. And up to today, there are about 3,000 DAGs um, in, in the system that's active. And it triggers about 220,000 uh, tasking systems on a daily basis. So because we are using this kind of like hybrid cloud kind of mode, so we have a lot of operators. We have over 200 plus operators that they're like, probably on average, we'll have more call operators than many other companies because we don't really like dominate, say like you should use this specific technology so people can move really fast. So lastly, we have, uh, we are supporting over a thousand active users who interact with the platform um, just from UI or uh, do the code contribution. So. Before 2016, uh, most of our, our work data workflow was scheduled on different variety of like cron jobs, right? And just like many other companies, we started to experiment some sort of like vanilla plus version of Airflow and started to test the dozens of DAGs and make it work. It did pretty well, but soon after it started to not work because that single environment becomes so powerful, it can impersonate to access most of the sensitive data set in a, in a company. Um, and we, we naturally just split up, just like many other people, right? We have multiple deployments and every team just manage their own thing. And sooner after that, it stopped working because some team are grow horizontally, just like data science org or infrastructure or security team, and they will become the same kind of evil environment. So we implement a new model where um, 19, we, we, we say, let's do task level, right? Like, let's just, let people go somewhere, like a specific tool to define a connection with a list of permissions, and they will say, okay, let's go to the task code and integrate that ID or connection into that code. And it sooner becomes super hard to manage because literally you have like a thousand or tens of thousands of unique tasks in the system, and now you have to do a lot of mapping and managing this connection to make sure you, know, you understand what goes where. And then even that breaking of the multiple clusters stop working because we have 50 plus environments, and because we have a very lean team, so, and we see it keep growing. Um, it's really hard to, you know, we, we have to do a, a tons of scripting to glue the system together, so the system can be like operated uniformly, but also customized, you know, independently. Um, so with all these challenges, um, last year, we also have a, like a strong push to do, to do from Airflow 1 to 2, and Python 2 to 3, just like so many other companies, right? So. We sit down together and just say, you know, there are so many unsolved problems and so many frictions on operation, also customer experience. Let's just build something right and move people over um, because 
so many things are changing at the same, same, same time. So today we are here to share some of the uh, major points or components that we are building uh, through all this journey. Um, and next I'm gonna hand over uh, to Han uh, from our team to talk about the infrastructure stuff. Thank you, Tony, for the introduction. Hello, everyone, this is Han. I'm software engineer leading the airflow development in SNAP. Um, today I would like to talk about the architecture choice. Um, if you deploy airflow, you will meet the similar situation here. Um, so if we focus on the cluster type, we have four options. Each of them has certain pros and cons. The first option, single tenant cluster, is simple and straightforward. It's good for small team with limited use case. Back in 2016, we deployed Airflow to um, a few VM, a single tenant. Um, it worked well. Um, our UK is just for sending daily report. Um, very straightforward. But the downside of single tenant is lack of isolation. When you have more team to use it, there's no isolation um, within the cluster. So the second option, multiple cluster provides certain level of isolation at team level. However, maintainability is a challenge. The last two options related to multi-tenant cluster, those are the best option for us. By considering the number of teams we need to support within the company, at the same time, we would like to keep the team lean. By, um, by saving the team lean, I mean we, we would like to have less than like three engineers within the project for the infrastructure side or the platform side. So the strategy is using small amount of multi-tenant cluster, we can get better balance on those three dimensions. To give you more context, here's the architecture back in 2018. Each team had their own cluster. Um, we had something like more than 60 of those in individual cluster. This provides certain isolation at team level. However, this isolation also may be unable to discover that from other team. So team in SNAP work very closely. They often have dependency from um, other team. So because of this, we had to build actual server just for checking cost cluster dependency. Yeah, there's other maintainability issue as well, so I won't cover them all today. So let's move forward to the architecture we have. Um, because of Kubernetes, scalable, scalability of Kubernetes, we can schedule thousand attacks um, in parallel. The key player is Kubernetes executor. So this Kubernetes executor make um, task level isolation possible. For multi-tenants, we import team level RBAC and port level resource access using internal tool. Um, so the overall structure got simplified, but still provide the best isolation. One interesting number to share, after moving to this architecture, the number of um, tenants was doubled. You, you can imagine like some of them are actually sharing the cluster before, but now they enjoy the benefits of like um, clear ownership. Okay, with the change of architecture, I also wanna bring up the change of that development. Um, before that, I would like to thank astronomer on actual CLI, um, which is super convenient, <laughs> yes, super convenient to bring up the local airflow. Um, our, our team use that a lot. Um, the problem of that is um, Docker, uh, uh, Docker using a lot of resource in local when running uh, airflow. It's slow and the fence loud. Um, second, it's really hard to manage resource asset permission. Um, so you had to somehow get um, personal credential or server account permission in local, right? Um, um, so it has certain security concern. Lastly, locals had um, slightly different code paths as well as one-time environment. So uh, it, it, it caused certain inconsistent behavior with production. Um, so we introduced remote app along with architecture upgrade. So each user had their own Airflow instance deployed in um, Kubernetes namespace on demand. So we leverage Scaffold for faster data iteration. Scaffold is um, open source from Google, 
making Kubernetes CI CD fast and easy for development. The local code chain can automatically sync to remote with a couple seconds. More importantly, this fully managed remote cluster is integrated with our in-house asset control tooling. So um, user can easily configure permission with the same tooling from production. So now I, I would like to hand it over to Nancy to talk about the resource control. Thanks, and uh, my name is Nancy Chen, and uh, uh, today I will talk about ex uh, identity and uh, access management for Airflow in Snap. And uh, our uh, in-house solution, uh, also called, uh, named as Job Access Manager, uh, operates as an intermittent service, but it has deeply integration with Airflow. And uh, following the creation of the DAG, and the user can leverage uh, uh, Job Access Manager's UI to uh, create a job profile, which includes information such as DAG ID, its stage environment, authorized users, and the contact info information, etc. And uh, subsequently, and uh, a associated service count is generated, and uh, it is linked to this stack. And our permission model is very simple, and uh, it's request and approve model. Uh, user can request permissions for the jobs on the Job Access Manager UI, and uh, uh, after the approval from the resource means, and the permissions will be granted to the service count. And here I want to talk about the uh, security model which uh, we use. We, we adopt a one service kind of DAG model. And uh, someone may argue that the task level segmentation, uh, but we conclude that it is most appropriate to do uh, DAG level segmentation in SNAP because it balances least, privi uh, least privilege and uh, usability. Uh, after all, waiting for approval, resource approval is the most, like, least favorite activity for engineers. And also, it's more convenient to manage thousands of DAGs comparing to like 20 times uh, the number of tasks. So uh, in a case that uh, uh, task level uh, segmentation is really designed, and uh, we usually ask our DAG owners to break down their uh, DAGs into smaller ones. And uh, workload identity is the technology that uh, empowers our seamless integration between uh, Airflow and the Job Access Manager. Um, in our setup, uh, all DAGs are running in the same GK clus uh, cluster, but dif uh, differentiated by their uh, unique DAG ID. And uh, uh, when a DAG is created, uh, user uh, need to put the DAG ID and its st state environment in the Job Access Manager, and the Job Access Manager can derive a Kubernetes service count from its DAG ID, and uh, uh, subsequently, uh, Job Access Manager uh, invokes the GKE API to create a Kubernetes service count in the target cluster, and simultaneously, it binds the GKE uh, a Kubernetes service count to a GCP service count, uh, as shown in this graph as step two and step three. And then in step four, once a DAG is, uh, is uh, scheduled for execution, and uh, its container is equipped with Kubernetes service count, because of the linkage between the Kubernetes service count and the GCP service count, uh, a DAG is able to use the credential from GCP service count and use it to access different resources. Um, because of this convenience, and uh, we are able to get rid of the credentials stored in the metadata DB and uh, get rid of uh, connection, I, uh, connection, and uh, which significantly reduces the uh, usage and also the potential leakage of credentials such as service account keys. Uh, I'm not sure about in other company, but uh, in Snap, like permission management is always a headache for many engineers. And uh, uh, our model is to our software is to try to make this uh, process as simple as possible. And uh, uh, on the Airflow UI, user can conveniently click a link within each DAX uh, page, and uh, this will redirect them to the uh, Job Access Manager site, uh, which contains the job profile. And uh, this single page also int uh, seamlessly int uh, integrated with uh, some IAM such as GCP IAM, AWS IAM, internal and external services. So that allows users to uh, uh, manage all the permissions in one single uh, stop without the need to go to different many systems. And also because of this convenience, um, users usually, in most cases, do, they do not have to know the service kind of used for the DAC. Uh, which hardens the security by decoupling the service count access from employee access. And also, thanks to this all-in-one model, 
and uh, we are able to abstract many rows, uh, consolidated rows, in, like into abstract rows. And uh, for example, um, when a cross project service count is used for data flow, and there are like several permissions, uh, a seven like permissions to be configured for GCP uh, for uh, data flow uh, service count and uh, data flow uh, worker service count. We simplify this use case by providing one uh, abstract rows to the end user and handle all the complex complicated. Uh, logic in the background, and uh, this is uh, this was really appreciated by our customers, and uh, we use it for other scenarios such as data proc, uh, data proc and uh, Spark. And uh, we talked about uh, user uh, user experience. User experience is not that important, but uh, security also uh, holds the same uh, significance. And uh, in the past, uh, service count was shared by many uh, DAX, uh, result the accumulation of permissions. Um, and uh, some service count were just uh, over provision for uh, individual tax. And uh, because of the isolation of identities, we are able to uh, uh, enforce this provision principle, which means uh, each tag should only possess the permission to fulfill its, uh, its business logic. And uh, uh, given the periodic uh, nature of each tag, and uh, we can easily find out uh, if a permission is unused or inactive for several peer, uh, so for several DAG runs, then th this permission is highly no need uh, not needed by this DAG, and we can remove it. And uh, as a result, we implement an automated system uh, to look at the access audio logs and uh, remove those unused permissions. And uh, this really gives us like high efficiency in uh, permission re uh, review and security review. And uh, now I will hand the time to Yuri to talk about other aspects of uh, security. Thank you, Nanchi. Hi, I'm Yuri Desatnik. It's good to be here. Uh, and I'm a technical program manager in security for the Airflow project at Snap. So I'd like to talk about the role-based access control system that we've implemented uh, for our Airflow. And um, th the basic premise of this um, RBAC system is that we use access groups that are representative of teams to control access to the UI and also to acquisition of resources by these DACs. So as Nanshi mentioned before, each DAC has its own service account. And so um, members of the team can actually access a limited group of DAGs that no other team can have access to as far as controlling the DAGs, and also can request resources for these service accounts for these DAGs. Now there is also a decoupling of ownership between the people that control these DAGs and the service accounts. That means that the resources that are required by the service accounts through the job access manager, the, the people that actually control these DAGs do not have access to. Another security feature that I want to mention is the CICD checks that we have on DAGs. So a number of security vulnerabilities can be introduced into DAGs. These are Python security vulnerabilities and other types as well. For example, uh, secrets in code. Um, the uh, container escape vulnerabilities that, that allow arbitrary workloads to be executed, uh, and also connection ID, which we do not allow in uh, the Airflow v2 configuration that we have. So we have these checks happening in three places. The first place is from a local push to, to a branch. Another one is uh, the committing the PR to master, and a daily check on the master branch in, in case some admins introduce vulnerabilities inadvertently by pushing code directly to it. And we have a library of these vulnerabilities that gets updated regularly, and it gets integrated into these checks on an ongoing basis. Now I want to talk about migration. So there are several migration challenges that we had. And um, of course, engineering resources, DAG owners are busy people. So we, have, um, we had over 120 teams, over 3,000 DAGs, and we need to figure out a way how to entice these folks to come over to the new platform by talking about the positive aspects of Airflow v2 and other benefits that they're going to get with moving to the new platform. Another challenge was operator availability. So we had to port a bunch of operators from v1 to v2 and have them conform to the security standards of the new system. This was a challenge as well. And also we had to think about arbitrary workloads that were generated by GKE pod operators and SSH operators. And also migration efficiency. How do we make migration simple, fast, and error-free? And how do we engage and facilitate customer team to migrate? 
So our migration flow uh, is described in the blue boxes in this, in this diagram. And in the yellow boxes are the actual migration tools that we created to facilitate this. We'd start with freezing of the DAG. The converter tool would run the migration and get us most of the way there. And then uh, the customer would address additional code changes that were indicated as helper text within the new DAG. The job access manager that Nashi described before would ingest all the access from the previous service accounts that the DAGs had and would generate a new service account and provision it with the new access. A, render, uh, a diffing render tool would allow the DAG to be tested for a render comparison and then a PR would be created, merged, and if there were dependencies between the V1 and the V2 platforms, there was a metadata service that would make sure that the two could talk to each other. The, the ultimate goals was ease of migration and a good user experience. Uh, we wanted to make sure customers felt supported and we wanted to have zero negative production outcomes. I wanted to uh, give more information on a development that we made in this system. We had a tool created by one of our engineers which was a DAG generation from metadata tool. And, what it, and it actually worked for about 40% of the DAGs. What it did is ingested um, the metadata for the DAG and other information and used several Python scripts and templates to create a fully functional DAG that was deployable immediately. This reduced migration time from around 40 minutes to about five minutes. This was a huge boost in um, the velocity of migrations that we had. So I wanna talk about some takeaways from our presentation. First, on the infrastructure side, we moved from multiple Kubernetes clusters to one multi-tenant cluster that was much better for serviceability, maintainability, and visibility. And we created the remote server for testing and backfill to make sure that folks didn't run into the problem of trying to do this on their local machines with the Docker instance with varying results. On the security side, we determined that one service account per DAG was the best approach uh, for managing usability with security. And that mapped to the workload identity of the ex execution pod to create end-to-end -end isolation for execution. Our RBAC operated in two places. Uh, first in the UI of Airflow, and then on managing the service account access to resources. And it decoupled that access. And then of course, DAG code, CI, CD scanning to make sure vulnerabilities don't enter into the Python code. On the migration front, we always focus resources on maximum automation and try to innovate in that area. Uh, we wanted to have positive customer engagement and make sure that we got the best customer experience across all the teams that we work with. We wanted to have flexibility with our approach to different customers, depending on the business environment, depending on their deliverables. We wanted to work with them and schedule them in a way that was least disruptive to their operation. And finally, we got executive support because that had to be our backstop in case certain customers didn't want to migrate at all, right? Um, so uh, I just wanted to say that our approach to this is just one approach and it worked for us and perhaps um, it'll help all you folks if you're interested in uh, exploring more about how this all worked for migration. Um, but, uh, but definitely there are other approaches to do this. So I wanted to uh, thank uh, the folks that organized this convention and also thank uh, the open source community for creating this awesome product. And um, at that point, if there are any questions, we definitely entertain them. Time for one or two questions. Um, yeah, just raise your hands. Cool. Thank you and the tan jacket were first. I have two questions. It's fine, I can. So first of all, when you added the Kubernetes executor, were there any concerns from internal teams, the task level latency that it was adding, that it was creating new part, I'm guessing one minute latency? I have another question as well, so I can ask both right away. The second one was around Oh, Let's limit it to one because we, we, we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> uh, I, I can do it. So, uh, yeah, I don't think so because most of the things we're working on, the uh, GKE, uh, the Kubernetes operator, are, are you talking about like this from the security perspective or something else? No, from the task. Okay. So, um, the, the binding was done. So the binding of the service account and the Google service account was done when the DAG was created. It's not even on the runtime. So the binding is already done. So when we, the when the task is spin up by the scheduler, it's that service account already have the permission. So it won't add in any uh, actual latency. 
Hi. Um, so you you mentioned like you had about like three thousand DAGs in your um, in your repositories. Like, is there a way for the users to like discover a DAG before they start writing a new one, so that they don't write an existing one, like a DAG discovery sort of thing, or like it's it's all just going to documentation or like repo? Uh, so, so could you could you repeat the question a little bit? I think it, he's asking if let's say an engineer wants to develop a new DAG, how can they check if that already exists so they don't just do double the work? I, I feel like is it I don't think it's related to the migration itself, right? It's yeah, he's just asking if you guys have any kind of like oh, internal okay. DAG discovery tool just for like identifying if there's yeah, already existing DAG. I, I honestly don't we don't have a you know working solution for this kind of like do duplicates of the DAGs because most of the time what we observe, actually we did talk to the customer and they even they are like a seemingly similar, but they all have different perspective. Most of the time I would say like ninety eight percent of the time, there won't be like a duplicate DAG. But there can be like some task that does the same thing. Uh, so we do have initiative to do like discoverability and just figure out, just like a previous presenter, like the upstream and downstream and some of the query analysis. And it's very likely to be possible for things like BigQuery, but it's really hard for things like data frog and data flow where you just have a jar. Um, so yeah, it's an open question. I don't think you have a good solution. Awesome. Um, all right, one more question or? No, yeah, I think we got to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, Snap Team. If you guys have any more questions, catch them after the show. Um, yeah.